So we have funded quite a bit of work to translate but very compelling global health evidence for very uh, specific places. You know, how much more likely would I be to get lung cancer if I live on a busy road in Birmingham or in Warsaw uh, or in Accra than if I lived in the countryside in that same place? Um, and those are the things like working with scientists to make sure that the statements that are being made by campaigners are scientifically credible, but that they're couched in language that your average person can understand and message tested so that it's the things that are most compelling to people um, is something that we spent quite a bit of time on. Well, good evening and thank you so much, President Monaco, for the very kind welcome and for, um, and for being here uh, this evening. I'd like to give a very special welcome also to friends and colleagues from the School of Medicine. I love seeing the two logos up there together. Uh, but also to, we've got colleagues here from the School of uh, Nutrition, Friedman School from Arts and Sciences. The Dean is even in the house, pleased to meet you, Jim. Uh, and from engineering, uh, from uh, our veterinary school and from across the entire university. So it's, it's an important uh, evening for us. And I think a testament to the interest level in, in, in Jane Burston's uh, lecture. And so to our esteemed speaker tonight, Jane Burston. Jane is the founding executive director of the Clean Air Fund, a global philanthropic organization that works with governments, businesses, and NGOs to create a future where everyone can breathe clean air. The Clean Air Fund influences policy and decision makers to act on air pollution and partners with organizations that are driving data-driven policy change to improve global air quality. And so would you please join me in welcoming Jane Burston to give the Siegel Lecture. Well, thank you so much, uh, President Monaco and uh, Dean Kite for the warm welcome and the very kind introduction. Um, and I want to say a, a special hello as well to uh, Peter Seagal. Sorry you can't join us in person, but thank you very much for, for joining on Zoom. Um, it's a real honour and privilege to be giving the Seagal lecture, having heard about uh, Dr Seagal's history and how much he's clearly cared about people, had a vision and was able to turn that into a reality. So I hope I can uh, fulfill the brief of raising awareness, not just about the health harms of air pollution, but also about the people like Dr. Seagal who are doing something about it. Um, and I was gonna start with uh, this story that uh, Dean Kite just mentioned of Ella Kissy Deborah. Um, uh, a girl who grew up in Catford in southeast London, who very tragically died in 2013 of a severe asthma attack when she was aged just nine. Now, asthma attacks weren't new for Ella. She suffered uh, asthma so severely that she was hospitalized 28 times in the three years leading up to her death. And scientists looked into the data around those hospitalizations and realized that they coincided with peaks in air pollution by her home. Um, whenever she had gone to hospital, unfortunately, nobody had asked her where she lived. Because if they had, they'd have found out that she lived on the South Circular, which is one of London's most polluted and congested roads. We have this air pollution data because it's one of London's most polluted roads. And so that's where one of the main monitors are based. And it's this data that helped her mom, Rosamond, push for air pollution to be written as the cause of death on her death certificate, which, uh, as Dean Kite says, she achieved a couple of years ago. And now she's using that fact to, to try and push through very ambitious legislation that she's called Ella's Law through Parliament. But tragically, cases like Ella's, although it sounds rare, she's the first person to have air pollution written as the cause of death on her death certificate. It's not so rare. I mean, I don't know. I've spoken to a number of uh, students and faculty members today who uh, think about and work on air pollution a lot. Don't know whether anyone in the, the lecture knows how many premature deaths the World Health Organization would ascribe to air pollution globally or what percentage. Have a guess. Come on. 4.1 million. Any other takers? 
Okay, well, uh, somebody knows their facts. Um, <laughs> so 7 million deaths attributed to, uh, to air quality, premature deaths by the World Health Organization. Uh, 4.1, 4.2 million of them uh, to outdoor air pollution, which is the main thing that I'm going to be talking about today. And that's 15% of deaths globally. 15% an incredibly large number. This is just for, for the sake of comparison with other, um, other topics that we know about. And uh, as well as these individuals, there are also many millions more people suffering from illnesses that are either caused by or exacerbated by air pollution and having their quality of life very severely affected. Um, the groups that are most affected are often the most vulnerable. So we've talked about children and they're vulnerable because they breathe close to the ground, whether they're in a stroller or they're walking. Um, concentrations of pollution are often much greater close to the ground. Some of it's heavy. Um, we don't monitor down there. We monitor at the height of an average human man, um, like all science. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we often don't know just how bad it gets where kids are breathing. They spend more time outside, often playing and they're more physiologically vulnerable. They breathe faster, so they're taking on a kilo of body weight, and their organs are developing. So pollution can really affect developing lungs and developing brains. And the other groups that are more vulnerable, say, for example, low-income families, um, are also more exposed. You know, wherever you are in the world, the people who are least able to afford to move are the ones living next door to a busy road, next door to an industrial facility, and they tend to have either less access to healthcare or pre-existing health conditions that makes them more physiologically vulnerable as well. So it's a really an, an equity issue um, as well as a climate and health issue. And unfortunately, last piece of bad news for the evening, um, the problem is getting worse. Uh, unlike other environmental health risks, which we're uh, fortunately tackling, um, Air pollution, outdoor air pollution is forecast to get much worse over the coming decades and uh, for deaths to double by 2050 if we don't do something. So now for the good news. Um, and there's lots of bits of good news. Uh, it's the, the, the main piece of good news is that there is a huge opportunity not just to save millions of lives um, and to improve lots of quality of life and improve equity, but also that in doing so at the same time, we can tackle climate change. Why? Well, the causes of climate change are very often the same as the causes of health harming air pollutants. About two thirds of outdoor air pollution is caused by burning fossil fuels. So things like transport and traffic pollution, industry, um, domestic heating, domestic power, all of these fossil sources and the solutions uh, to, to using fossil fuels can be the same for air pollution as for climate change. Renewable energy, clean heating, uh, transformation of industry, more public transport and electric vehicles. And um, you know, climate change, Dean Kai alluded to this in her introduction, climate change is often uh, politically divisive. And whilst people really genuinely care about climate change in the States. I think it's more than two thirds of people say that they're somewhat or very concerned about climate change. It's about the same in the UK. It's about the same in many countries around the world. It's often hard for people to factor that into their day-to-day decision-making. You know, I'm in a rush. I've got to get the kids to school. I've got to get dinner on the table. Where does climate change come in my decision-making priorities? Um, Oftentimes, air quality can seem more urgent, more tangible, more immediate, and people can feel that they have more agency over it. Um, I noticed when I was working at the National Physical Laboratory and talking about air quality that um, people would immediately leap to the sorts of things that they could do. Whereas when I gave talks on climate science, people were sometimes baffled. They would ask, you know, why would we do something when China is such a large emitter? And people just tended to feel a lot less agency over it. Um, so in working on uh, tackling air pollution, as long as we prioritize reducing those fossil fuel sources, we can get the health and the climate benefits at the same time. And so long as we factor in considerations of equity, make sure that the policies that we're putting in place aren't also harming those least able to afford 
say, the new vehicle or to pay for their car to be driven into a city centre, um, then we can tackle equity issues at the same time. Um, another major opportunity of tackling uh, air pollution is the economic benefit. Um, because tackling air pollution can pay for itself many times over. Um, you immediately think, well, I, I immediately think when I think of the economic benefits of, uh, of reducing air pollution, of the health system cost. So avoiding having to pay in the national health system for treating the people that are sick because of air, air pollution. But we funded, um, at the Clean Air Fund, we funded the Confederation of British Industries Economics Division to work out what the economic benefit to business would be of reducing pollution in the UK. And even in a relatively uh, lower pollution environment like the UK, uh, these are the numbers that they came up with. This is the, the economic benefit of reducing pollution from the level that it's at at the minute to what the World Health Organization at the time was recommending. So it's about a 50% uh, reduction in pollution. Uh, once that new level had been reached, um, 3 million additional working days would be gained each year for people who previously would have been at sick or at home looking after sick kids that can now uh, show up to work. And the, the benefit of that is to British industry, 1.6 billion every year. So this does not even include the health system cost. It also doesn't include uh, the short term cognitive benefits of being able to concentrate better. There's, there's quite a bit of research, um, mostly out of China, on how even small increases in air pollution inside a factory, for example, have really quite significant productivity impacts. And that's not included in this number either. Um, we funded a very similar piece of research in India uh, through Dalberg, uh, the consultancy, and with the Confederation of Indian Industry. And uh, in India, the cost to the economy, to the private sector, was $95 billion, which is about 3% of Indian GDP. And that's, that was also not including uh, issues for specific sectors like international tourism uh, or the fact that retail footfall drops quite significantly on high air pollution days. Nor does it factor in the long term cognitive decline if you know, kids are trying to concentrate and do their schooling in a high pollution environment, what that means for their future earning prospects. So a huge potential benefit if we can prioritize the climate action that also reduces pollution. Um, so what, what are people doing with this? Is there momentum building? Is there change happening as a result of all of this research? Um, well, yes, I think there's a huge amount of momentum led by the research. This is a very quick and dirty analysis of uh, the increase in research studies that have been done over the last decade. Um, just simply publications that are tagged as health and air pollution. We didn't do any independent analysis on how accurate the tagging is, but you know the trend is clear. Uh, there's been this huge uptick in academic research on air quality, and what has followed is, a, is this, you know if you're going to draw the same chart of public concern, mentions in the media, mentions in political speeches, institutional interventions, uh, new laws, the charts look the same. Um, funding. Uh, international philanthropic funding and, and uh, development agency funding. I mean, this, we're in the foothills. There's still a huge amount to be done because we're starting from an incredibly low base here. Um, but just as an example with the funding, philanthropic funding to air quality is, I think, 0.1 of a percent of all philanthropic funding. Development agencies, it's half a percent. So there's still a lot more to be done, but that's an increase from near zero historically. So I wanted to leave you because I know we're going to uh, get in conversation and I'm looking forward to hearing all of your uh, questions and opinions, but I wanted to leave you with three examples of uh, what this momentum is transferring into in the world, a local and national example, a regional one and a global one. Um, so we do a lot of work in Poland and um, the, some of the partner organizations that we work with produce this poster. It's lungs. They're made out of the same filter paper that air pollution monitors use, and they used to be white. 
So just like an air pollution monitor, which is white filter paper with a vacuum behind, so it's, it sucks pollution onto the paper, um, as, as do these lungs. They went black over the course of a week. We had the similar poster in uh, an area in London called Putney, where I used to live on the high street. It took two weeks. Uh, same poster in Look Now in India. It took two days. And people see this and they see, you know, this is what's happening inside my lungs. Um, in India, I know that the organization, we hadn't funded this work, but the organization who did it then chopped this filter paper into little pieces and posted it off to politicians uh, so that they could have this, you know, they could stick this postcard on their wall and they could, they could have a piece of this black lung to remind them uh, of what action needed to be taken. So grassroots organizations have mobilized uh, people. They've produced very visible uh, ways of raising awareness like this. And as a consequence, they've had a couple of really big wins in the last year. Um, in the central region of Poland, Masovia region, which is where the capital city is, uh, domestic coal burning has been banned um, in Warsaw from this year and in the rest of the region from 2028. And um, also on a national level, new legislation has been passed that means low emission zones are possible for the first time. And 12 mayors have committed to putting in place low emission zones where they charge for the most polluting vehicles. On a regional level, um, uh, again, in Europe, the European Commission has just put out very strict uh, environment air quality standards for consultation. So uh, we're, we're supporting act action to make sure that these are accepted. And on a global level, some of the world's biggest companies have come together to form the Alliance for Clean Air with the World Economic Forum. And for the first time ever, they're going to be measuring the air pollution footprint of a company, reporting that, setting reduction targets and working together to raise awareness with their constituents. So I will leave you with those examples. Uh, very much look forward to your questions and thank you so much for listening. Um, oh, yeah. So those lungs, huh? That's like 40 woodbines, <laughs> as my grandfather would do, get through. Um, so, so you work all over the world. Um, and I think what we, what we got a sense of is that some things are true. And then every country's political economy, every city's political economy is different, right? Where does the pushback come? Once, you know, once the population understands that it's breathing toxic air, I mean, that must be terrifying. So then how do you build momentum around that? What have you learned about the pushback? Yeah, I mean, there is still, even though it's true that um, people can be more focused on the health impact of climate action uh, because it's more local. And it's true that it's hard to argue against children's health, for example. Uh, there is still opposition, as there always will be. I think it's, it's where uh, the action required is quite fundamental behaviour change. Um, so an example we've seen in London recently is the, um, the ultra-low emission zone, where it started in the centre of London. It's now been expanded to a really very significant uh, percentage of London, about 5 million people. And, um, and there's very strong compliance. And now the mayor is suggesting expanding it again to cover the whole of London, so 10 million people. Um, public transport isn't as good in the, uh, the outer area of London, and so part of the package that the mayor has introduced is additional public transport, a scrappage scheme to help people convert their vehicles. There's lots of incentives. You know, um, uh, People who have to drive their car and are disabled have a, have a specific scheme um, to enable them to change their vehicle. But still, there will be people who don't want to give their old diesel car up and uh, they don't like the scheme. So I think there's um, all a mayor can do is provide as many incentives as there are, as many carrots as there are sticks um, and uh, hope that the grassroots organisations come out and support. So one of the reasons when you were telling the story of Rosamond and Ella, yeah. 
one of the things you made the point was that there was an air quality monitor right on the south circular right? so on this really horrible busy congested road so how do you build a constituency for action on clean air in countries where those monitors because you've been very data driven yeah. it seems in the work that you've done so do we have to sort of fight for air quality monitors in cities around the world uh, is that happening Yes. So, yes, we do have to fight for them. And um, so I, my background is this National Physical Laboratory. And one of the things that uh, one of the teams in my department did there was test the new lower cost sensors. And they're useful for some things. So they won't give you the correct absolute number, but you know you, they can tell you, is this street more polluted than that street or is it more polluted today than it was yesterday? Um and uh, there was a view that they were never going to be useful for kind of regulation or for changing government action. And an example that I saw in Bulgaria really changed my mind about that. Um, a very committed citizen started buying low cost sensors, distributing them around. He got his friends to stick them on their balconies. And whilst the absolute numbers weren't correct, they were, they were the ones making the data transparent in a way that the government was not and the government said, take this down. These, these numbers aren't right. And the government was correct, too. The numbers weren't spot on. But the fact that there was no, they didn't produce their number meant that this was the only data people could use. So uh, as a consequence of this action by the citizens, the government then started publishing the real data. Um, and now that same group of citizens is still doing their monitoring, but they're also um, advocating for the monitors to be moved to more sensible locations, away from parks, towards uh, some of the more congested junctions so that we get a properly accurate picture of the pollution levels. So I think, I mean, citizen advocacy in lot can be useful in lots of ways. And then sometimes it's getting the data where there is none. And sometimes it's pushing the government to be transparent about the data that does exist. Um, but yeah, we, we absolutely need monitoring everywhere. And there's still many, especially African countries, that have none at all. So you, you said we, we had an opportunity to have coffee this morning. You said something really that's just stuck with me all day, which is that if, you've, if you're afraid of being ill, that may spur you into action. But if you think it's going to kill you, then that actually may suppress your sort of response to it. So you talked about WHO's mortality figures but the morbidity figures must be extraordinary. And then there's all this recent research on what it's doing to the cognitive capability mm -hmm. of young kids. And I, I remember when I first got briefed on some of that research, it's really terrifying uh, as, a, as a parent. Or as, as So how does this sort of combination of scaring people a little bit and getting them to act, to ask for action, it seems to me that this balance is a big theme in a lot of climate action and in a lot of public health action, right? You're a little bit frightened, but if you're mm. too frightened, you just paralyze, right? You freeze, you don't do anything. Yeah, and I think if you do, it, the, with the death statistics um, in particular, people find it just very difficult to believe that that will be them. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of focus group research about how the most compelling messages to motivate action are the ones based around the avoidance of disease because I can imagine that I might get lung cancer, but I can't imagine dying. Um, so, yeah, I think the, uh, one of the key things that we've found is making the data as local as possible so that people can see themselves in it. Um, there's lots of stats, like some of the ones that I've shown, um, that are global in nature. And that also, may, even if you live in a very polluted place, that also makes you think, that's not me, that's happening elsewhere. Um, and so we have funded quite a bit of work to translate that very compelling global health evidence for very uh, specific places. You know, how much more likely would I be to get lung cancer if I live on a busy road in Birmingham or in Warsaw uh, or in Accra than if I lived in the countryside in that same place? Um, and those are the things like working with scientists to make sure that the statements that are being made by campaigners are scientifically credible, but that they're couched in language that your average person can understand and message tested so that it's the things that are most compelling to people um, is something that we spent quite a bit of time on.
So we've got we've got microphones. So th- I'm going to ask one last question, and then please um, assemble uh, peacefully, uh, peaceably, uh, uh, by the microphones, and we'll take some questions from the audience. So my last question is a personal one. So you're in a, a, a university, you're in a school of uh, full of people who are building international careers or careers in, in public health and other aspects of uh, of making the world a better place. So your career's had a few dog legs in it, right, as we say. <laughs> Very you've, you've had a portfolio yeah. career, which is what everybody's building here. Um, what's, I mean, do you have advice for this esteemed bunch of change makers or I mean, that must have been quite gutsy, right? I mean, you're a non-scientist in a in the laboratory. You're, I mean, you've done interesting things, and then this was a whole new thing, right? You just there was nothing in it in the space. You just occupied it. Where did the courage come from? Um, none of it felt difficult or um, scary at the time. I think I've I've gone from. Uh, I just see where I feel like I could have the next biggest impact and jump there. I think especially at the MPL after a a few months where everybody assumed that I had a PhD in physics and I didn't have an A-level yet, I do now. Um, That was quite frightening. (laughs) But the move, the move didn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't scary right then. So I think, um, I mean, advice wise, the worst advice I ever got was, uh, you know, plan your career out. Think about where you want to be five years from now. You know, it's the kind of typical career center question that you get asked. And I just think it's a terrible question, <laughs> you know, because I would have done none of the things that I'd done if I'd been, you know, doing things for the sake of the next thing and plotting out a path. Uh, opportunities come up and your interest changes and where you think you can have the, the biggest impact changes over time. So don't think about it do what the most fun thing is um okay i think fun's the operative word here for the, <laughs> for, the for the members of the office of career services of fletcher i hope you're taking <laughs> notes um so do we have questions from the audience ah here we go hello hi no, thanks for all your work um the, I'm a member of Citizens Climate Lobby, so for years we've been advocating for putting a price on uh, carbon pollution, and um, and I'm wondering what you think of that, and and also we use the En-ROADS Climate Simulator Program, and and in that they will show you like everything that affects affects the climate, and how it impacts if you do something about coal or Im- improve solar. And um, so, and, and they conclude that putting a price on uh, pollution is the most effective thing to do. So I'm wondering about that. And if I can sneak in two more questions. <laughs> <laughs> One is what you think of natural sequestration and mechanical sequ- sequestration. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I'll answer all of these while I'm taking another one. My brain isn't big enough to remember more than three. Um, so putting a price on carbon, I think, is an incredibly good idea. However it's done, whether it's a tax or an emissions trading scheme, um, with pollution, you'll have seen from the data, we've tried really hard to make the price of pollution clear because what we know is even if the environment department or the health department and the government decides to do something, they then have to get it past the treasury. And what the Treasury will say is this isn't affordable. So while you'll have the costs of action on the one hand, you also need the benefits. Um, uh, so I, I very much am in favor of putting a price on carbon and making it super clear, even before we have that, what, what price we're paying uh, for climate inaction. Um, and on sequestration, I, you know, it's, it's so necessary. I think Dean Kite is probably a better person, place to answer the question than me. But uh, there's a huge chunk of um, decarbonization that needs to be represented by natural sequestration. Uh, I, I don't have a strong opinion on any of the new technologies, but perhaps. You have to go to a place I, down the road. <laughs> I think well, they're working on a few of those. So, uh, no, but I think we're, I think we're deep, deep into territory of reducing emissions, right? So making choices about energy 
uh, uh, sources of energy, transportation choices, etc. As you know, in CCL, um, thank you for all your hard work. But uh, but also we're deep into the territory of having to remove emissions now. And I think over the next, I mean, this is the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, over the next 24 months, I'm looking at some of the students uh, right there. Um, I think uh, we're going to start to see negotiations around effective ways to remove emissions. Um, so, Ada, hi. Talking of graduate students. <laughs> Can you hear me? There we are. Um, hi, uh, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Etta Cosma. I'm a second year master's student here at the Fletcher School. Um, and I do, I'm doing some of my master's research around national greenhouse gas inventories. Um, and I was really you know, curious if you could tell us more about the work that you're doing to start thinking about how we might quantify and collect that data around um, air pollution that is being emitted by country or companies, excuse me. I think, you know, what struck me is like Google, you don't necessarily think of their operations as being, you know, as carbon intensive, um, certainly computing and processing power. That's different types of air pollution, but could you just talk more about that project? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. So it's quite new. This alliance was launched um, at the Glasgow climate conference about just over a year ago and there's three things that the come so just to step back why bother doing something with these big companies so we know that um as i said the momentum in kind of research and uh, public concern and institutional interventions on air quality are all uh, is raising quite significantly the same was not true for corporate action so company, there's barely any companies talking about air quality. Um, so one of the first things that we did was uh, with the Confederation of Indian Industry set up a chief executives forum on clean air. Um, and what we saw was that that has a real benefit of talking about air quality with the public in a different way. Um, you know, if there's a government that or if, if people think that uh, pollution is a necessary consequence of economic development, it's actually businesses that can best persuade people out of that opinion and say, actually, you know, it's harming our business, it's harming productivity. Um, so that's why I get businesses involved. And on um, a global level, it's the kind of thing that can really accelerate action if there's a group of businesses voluntarily doing something that then might come along the line as mandatory later. Um, and we're seeing this now in Europe. So uh, this group of businesses have committed to three things. One is this measuring the air pollution footprint and setting a, get, once they've got the baseline, setting a reduction target and reporting publicly on it. And on that one, um, over the course of the last year, they've funded the Stockholm Environment Institute to produce a guide, and that's now available online. Um, and they'll all be publishing their pollution footprints shortly. That guide can now potentially be the methodology, because it's the first time it has ever been attempted, can potentially be the methodology for uh, some mandatory corporate reporting that's coming in across the EU in 2024. Every, country, every company bigger than 500 employees will have to report their air pollution footprint. So, but there was no means of calculating that. So uh, it was possible that that would be removed from the corporate uh, sustainable reporting directive because companies could quite fairly have said how will we do this? So now there's a way for them to do it, uh, which has been tested by some of the biggest names going. Um, but the, uh, to your point about Google, I would agree. And I think that for many of the companies, the reporting on air pollution footprint is simply a hygiene factor. And the other two commitments that they made will be where the substantial action happens. And those other two commitments are to talk about air pollution and how to avoid it with their stakeholders. So that might be speaking with governments about the need for strict regulation, supporting ambitious politicians and what they're trying to achieve. It might be talking with customers or employees about what they could do. And the third uh, commitment is to somehow use their business assets to drive change. And something that Google has been doing with uh, their street view cars is putting reference grade air quality monitors in the car and as the car drives around doing the mapping and taking photos, they're also sampling pollution every 30 meters. So they've been able to build up for the cities where they've done it, the most granular picture of air pollution ever achieved. 
uh, IKEA um, have been buying. So one of the sources of um, air pollution in India at certain times of the year is crop stubble burning. The farmers harvest a crop, burn the remainder, and then quickly plant the next um, crop. And IKEA has been, instead of allowing that to be burned, buying that crop stubble and turning it into straw products. So I think that like that third one for me is the super exciting one. It's where, you know, if you could imagine if Google put air pollution on Google Maps every single time you looked at it, you could see the route that you could take that would reduce your exposure or your pollutants the most. That would be quite compelling and would really start to get people thinking about the pollution levels that they're exposed to um, in order to get them there. They need to have figured out their own impact first, because otherwise they it's difficult for them to talk about it. Um, so I, I think you're right there. The servers is probably not the most polluting activity you can imagine, but it's a necessary before they start to work on other things. Great, thank you very much. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. I actually, um, I'm very curious to know more about like, for developing nations, um, it's really difficult for the government to get a budget to actually put air quality sensors all over, and maybe they don't even care that much. Um, so I'm just curious to know also your perspective, if it's kind of like, if there is a business case for maybe companies in developing nation, in developed nations to maybe fund this initial air quality sensors and put them you know, in specific nations, collect this data and maybe use that for specific, you know, profitable purposes, uh, either with the government or with, you know, um, other entities. But I'm just thinking like if just not to depend on the government to kind of take that initiative. Uh, so I'm just curious to know more about that. And if you've experienced something like that somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, th there's huge opportunity for businesses to step in and other organizations. Um, the, there's a story about um, the US, uh, US embassies who have air pollution monitors on all of their buildings. And the engineer who set the pollution monitors up had different um, names for the different amounts of pollution. And there was, they named the, the kind of top bracket crazy bad. Um, and apparently then, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the reference grade monitor that everybody in Beijing was looking at when they didn't trust the government monitors because the US one was always reading quite a lot higher. And so then it got to crazy bad uh, and that went viral. And that's one of the things that people uh, point to um, when they're looking at how quickly change happened on air quality um, and the government's attitude towards it in China. So for sure, an, an independent, trusted entity in, in uh, countries where either there's no data or citizens don't trust government data would be very useful. And actually, some of the businesses on that list are thinking about maybe doing that on their headquarters. Um, so I think it's, it, you know, it's a very useful service that they could provide. But there's also a lot of potential in these lower cost sensors to bring the cost down to an affordable level for developing countries. And I do think that there's still the business case for them to do it. You know, they, the government ought to be the ones funding this long term um, because you need it to understand what, where this, what the sources are and whether the policies that you're implementing are making any difference. Please. Uh, Jane, thank you very much for your presentation. My name's John Howe. I'm an alumnus of the Fletcher School, uh, and I've been working in clean energy since I was here in the 80s as a student. I, I think the consensus in the public here in America, and I think in Britain, is that clean air regulation has by and large been a great success. Um, the, it's uh, much less of a problem today in developed countries than it was uh, in the 70s and 80s, we can point to successes on the front of uh, reducing acid rain and emissions trading schemes have, have by and large been quite successful. So it's alarming to hear you say that the forecast is for a doubling of uh, impacts over the coming decade. And I'm wondering if this is because the, of the increased industrialization in the developing world and the failure to use state-of-the-art technologies and, and have the same kind of uh, 
air regulation, air regulatory, uh, re uh, regulatory frameworks. And I wonder if you could offer a word on how the nature of the problem has changed over these decades. For example, um, particulate emission, uh, emissions were a serious problem here in the States half a century ago. We seem to have addressed, uh, have addressed well the problem of large particulates, but smaller particulates can pose more of a threat to, uh, uh, to small children and their lungs. So there are problems that are getting better, but there are other problems perhaps that are getting worse. I wonder if you could uh, address that uh, issue. I can try. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, it was a doubling by 2050 if we don't do anything different. And you're right that those deaths are predominantly in low and middle income countries. Um, there's a lot of urbanization and uh, development without thought for how to not bake in polluting sources from the beginning. Um, I was, uh, we just recently set up an office in Accra in Ghana, and I went and visited a city called Tamale, which pre-pandemic uh, was one of the fastest growing cities in the world. And uh, until very recently, about 95% of the trips there have been done by two-wheeler, so bicycle or motorbike. And when I went there, I've never been before, but there's a, the most beautiful tarmac road, very recently built, uh, but no bike lane. And the car that I was traveling in was like, you know, they can go fast because there's no potholes. And they're beeping at these cyclists, kind of running them off the road. Um, and it did make me think, you know, in London, we're trying really hard to get people back on their bicycles. Here's a city where people are naturally traveling by bicycle. And uh, we build infrastructure that makes it unsafe, uh, much riskier thing to do and very unpleasant for people. So, um yeah, I, the the lack of joined up thinking on kind of economic development and uh, reducing pollution sources is baffling to me. Um, and even in the kind of climate and health worlds, climate budgets don't have health metrics. There's no way of mm -hmm. accounting for health benefits in climate funding. Same for, for health. There's no way of accounting for climate benefits. And it just means that we're constantly missing a trick where we could fund something that would have multiple benefits and we don't because the metrics by which we decide are wrong. Um, and then your question about what, which things are getting worse. I mean, I think some of it is the more we learn, the worse things get. You know, sci scientists are just naturally conservative in their assumptions. And there's just some things that we haven't known about, like the ultrafine particles that you were talking about that aren't even measured because we don't have the monitors to do it. And so that now we find out you know, recent research is that um, I read recently 30% of miscarriages in Southeast Asia are attributed to air pollution. Uh, there's links between air pollution and dementia, Parkinson's disease. These are new links that we haven't seen before. Um, and so it can appear that the situation is getting worse, but it's just that we understand it better. I mean, I think it is also getting worse. Um, but I, I would say ultrafine particles is probably, as you uh, point out, the main um, area where we're learning new things. So I, please. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Ronak. I'm a second year master's student. I'm also from New Delhi. So this issue matters a lot to me. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, there's a lot of emerging research, um, particularly in large cities, looking at the correlation between air pollution and, and uh, housing markets and the changes to property rates. Uh, I'm wondering what you think the implications of that could be, particularly on low income groups and gentrification. Is there any um, is this a factor that's come up in the research you funded at all? Thank you. Um, yes, I have seen similar. I hadn't seen it in Delhi, actually, but there's a group in the UK that's trying to publish air pollution data and make it affect house prices in order, as a kind of advocacy aim, in order that people then really make sure that pollution gets fixed outside their home because they don't want the house price to drop. Um, but it's a, it is a very good point, the gentrification. And uh, we focus on that when we're looking at city-based policies. There's lots of evidence that, for example, the, the wider the geographical area of the policy, the more equitable, because as soon as you start con you know, doing very specific urban developments or uh, very contained low emission zones, for example, 
gentrification issues come up and the and in fact the potential to push uh, more pollution to the lower income areas as say for example vehicles move to the streets that are not controlled um so we we always uh, will make sure that the policymakers can see the evidence and take it into account when they're figuring out where exactly to do the policy and how big an area it should cover taking me back to my old job where the informal settlements on on roads was always the big issue right you would move people away as and they were income but then lower income people would move in and sort of live in shanties across the along the main road because that was the easiest place and that was the filthiest air so it's, it is interesting like it's i i had a hypothesis that got blown apart um during the pandemic that the more local the intervention the more support it would get and it might have been execution um how it was executed but there's um there was a fund in the uk for uh closing off streets in on a neighborhood level low traffic neighborhoods it was called where people would put uh, get funding to put planters at the end of a street so that it made it into a dead end so you couldn't use it as a cut through and it was a way of reducing pollution uh during the pandemic when um people's respiratory systems were being challenged and the amount of uh polarization it has created in the UK is off the charts like the the wars on twitter and i even saw one photo of uh, so one of these planters had a wooden bench they're very cheap ways of blocking off streets had a wooden bench and somebody had hammered nails up through it <laughs> this is how much people hate it so like very local interventions can also make people very angry if they uh, and one of the reasons why some people have got angry is apparently because traffic is being pushed to the the streets where lower income people are more likely to live the, the data actually doesn't necessarily back that up but that's one of the reasons that they give so um i'm going to take the three people who are standing quick questions and we'll answer them thank you please hi there can you hear me yes so my name is olivia and kerry holstein i'm a local artist and activist so the um the example you used about uh from poland with the lungs really stuck to me and a uh, I, my mind went directly to brown coal production and wood burning production, which is a huge part of the GDP in, in Poland, right? So my question relates to that as well as the increased pressure through the Ukraine war on fossil fuel, you know, um, dependency or starting um, in some places starting to use more of that coal as a result of those prices. So what's how does civilian pressure combine with economic and social need to help make decisions about this reduction and how is it possible to ensure the success in the face of pressures like war you know quick yeah. question <laughs> <laughs> it's too much you know, your opinion and give me a break <laughs> um, yeah i mean it's it is very tricky interestingly the domestic coal burning ban in the masovia region got passed since the outbreak of the war um but it is very you know and and i know that uh many people are aware that um lots of russian gas was uh sold to poland also russian coal so it was easier for them to close off the coal contracts because they have a domestic source of coal but like you say it's more heavily polluting um i think it, I, it's really tricky for the politicians because like with the london example they are always trying to offer the incentives and the subsidies at the same time as the restriction um and poland has been uh, has benefited a lot from eu subsidy for um mm. domestic heat pumps um and a switch over from coal boilers that actually the subsidy used to be used to switch from a old coal boiler to a new coal boiler now that is uh, thankfully not possible um but the the yeah the, so the the incentive schemes are there and the government's job is needs to be to try and help citizens especially the lower income households that find it harder to access those kind of subsidies uh, because of the difficulty of the paperwork or other barriers to access them um but the yeah it's it's getting tough and it's getting tough to, especially for city mayors where a, a lot of this rubber is hitting the road please so Hello, thank you for coming. I'm Jacob Tots, a student at Tufts University. 
Uh, she asked my question, so I'm going to broaden <laughs> my question a bit. You said that the causes of air pollution are very similar to the causes of climate change, and a big factor is emissions from burning fossil fuels. What would you like to see happen with the oil and gas industry? <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think for the, for the start, to remove the subsidies that they already get. Um, you know, we're talking about subsidizing uh, renewable switch over to renewable technology, but actually, if you just removed subsidies from the oil and gas companies and created a level playing field in the first mm-hmm. place, things would be a lot better. So maybe I will just pick that one. <laughs> Leave it there. There are many other things. Thank you. Thank you. The subsidies are up in the last two years, so we didn't learn the lesson when you saw those charts just with emissions just collapse uh, in March 2020. Um, the degree, I think it's now $770 billion worth of subsidies a year. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Lian. Uh, I'm from Burma. Thank you for your wisdom and the work that you're doing. Um, my question is about uh, the allocation of resources, the funds um, in, in regards to like regions and countries that are facing civil war and conflicts and those steps. And in that case, what should be the international institution's role in uh, tackling uh, air pollutions. Uh, like a few years ago, uh, I was in Yangon and my friends from Germany, he always showed me how polluted Yangon is. And then he would encourage me to wear, wear a mask uh, <laughs> even before COVID. Uh, so um, yeah, I- I'm wondering what could be uh, done more to uh, regions that are facing a conflict. I know when I look at the list, uh, it's very high. Um, like most of the countries that are facing civil wars are uh, prone to uh, these air pol- pollutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, there are huge disparities in where the international funding goes. Um, there's a report that we produce actually every year on the state of global funding for air quality. And it shows that most of the money goes to uh, China and India on air quality. There's very little actually goes to African countries and Latin America. Southeast Asia is probably um, next after India and China. And I think um, it's interesting that the funding seems to kind of chase pollution around the world. You know, we see where it's getting polluted and we pay to shut stuff down rather than like this Tamale example, pay to have not created it in the first place. Um, I'm I'm not sure how, how conflict and civil war comes into that and um, uh, how you would prioritize countries that are experiencing conflict in this mix, but certainly it, there's a big imbalance. And I don't think that donors are thinking strategically about uh, pollution avoidance and maybe rebuilding post-conflict uh, as opposed to shutting things down. Well, so first of all, thank you for some excellent questions. Um, and thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you for just opening the window a little bit into air quality as something that is so fundamental to our health, uh, but also fundamental to the planet's health. Um, good luck in all that you do. Um, and uh, we've got highly motivated students in many of the jurisdictions in which you may want to work. So uh, um, I think you've set off uh, many, many ideas here. And here at Tufts, um, we aspire, well, we hold a very, very centrally our ethic of being civically engaged, of being, of producing uh, citizens that are going to go and take what it means to be a citizen in the 21st century to heart and do something with it. Um, Many of my fellow deans are here and uh, this is very important to who we are. And I think this sits quite centrally in what it means to make the world a better place. So please, ladies and gentlemen, Join me in thanking Jane Burstyn. Thank you.